With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. So you might have heard tell our Canadian friends had themselves an election last night. Uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau held on to a minority win, which means he will stay in power and they will try to form a government. But we've seen a lot of folks talking about it and putting it in perspective in American media. But the thing is, I really don't know much about Canadian politics. And I suspect quite a few of the American commentators commenting on it don't either. So we're going to do what we do best at Hertel. We're going to find somebody that actually knows what they're talking about. Our friend David Clement, who on top of being the North American Affairs Manager for Consumer Choice and the co-host of Consumer Choice Radio and writing all over the place, is a bona fide, certified, and authentic Canadian. So he knows all about this sort of stuff and he can explain it to us. Uh, what happened here? Because did we just kind of do 40 days of Canadian political theater to wind up right back where we started? Who gained and who lost from this election? And where does that leave Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who, remember, asked for this election? So we're going to break down the Canadian election a little today with an actual Canadian. We're going to listen and learn from our friend David Clement on her tell right after this. I'm happy to be once again talking to our friend David Clement, who is a Canadian, so he can explain the Canadian elections to us. How are you doing, my friend? Well, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Woke up uh, a little irritated, but uh, we'll get into that as to why I am so irritated with this election. Doing politics for a living will do that to you. It sure will. Uh, You told me a long time ago, and I've never forgotten this, one of the first conversations we had, but... You told me the core principle of Canadian elections and politics is basically don't be America. And that yeah. the American view of Canadian politics was, oh, we forgot you were over there. But it yeah. seems like the Trudeau years, the last few years before we get into this actual election, that's kind of been, I don't know if it was the Rolling Stone cover and the various scandals and those things, but it does seem like the Trudeau years, there's been a lot more crossover at least news coverage the last few years, the normal in Canadian politics. Did did it feel that way to you going into this election too? Uh, Yeah. I mean, so there's two things at play here. Um, So Canadians probably over consume U S media, especially in regards to politics. And that was um, increasingly true under Trump. Um, And, I think that the that elevated a lot of the discussion, and then when Trudeau started to kind of unravel and have his own scandals and his own missteps, um, the attention shifted back the other way because Canadian politics could then be reported on in a way that an American audience could very easily understand because, I mean, there are several prominent um, U.S. politicians who've, who've fallen into the, uh, oh, my God, did you see this photo of them so many years ago when they were wearing blackface or some inappropriate thing they said or did. And so there was some more coverage um, from the U.S. side in terms of what was going on in Canada, but it did largely just revolve around um, that blackface scandal and then how that kind of progressed um, as of the day before the election. A a new photo from the same incident uh, came out. Whether or not that changed anybody's votes, I don't think so, but um, it has been interesting to see U.S. media coverage of this. Now, the first thing about this particular election was Trudeau basically asked for this. This is something that's foreign to American viewers because we don't have called elections, but Canada does have the parliamentary system. Of course, that's heavily influenced from the British days and that style of government. So just real quick, kind of explain to the American audience and the worldwide audience that we have because we're worldwide now. Mm -hmm. A called election, the parliamentary system... Uh, the fact that this is going to be a minority government, just kind of run down for folks a little bit, the, 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 just the rough outline of the Canadian system and how all those things work. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, ex- I'll try to explain it in, in American terms. So essentially everybody runs for Congress. That's who fills obviously parliament. Right. Um, the exception is, is that it's not two parties. Uh, there are five parties with seats and realistically six parties that could have won a seat. 
Um, and so imagine if Congress was divided by uh, five parties um, and not one party didn't have a majority. So the Republicans or the Democrats didn't have a majority, which means that um, under usual circumstances, uh, if something goes to a vote on, on the floor, um, it can be voted down. And if it is voted down, that usually triggers an election. Um, so what happens when one party has the most seats, but not half of the seats is they have to basically horse trade with the other parties to get them to support um, what they want to pass. And throughout the pandemic, it's actually been a pretty smooth process. So all of the parties, they pushed and they like traded horses on certain things that levels of support and things like that. Um, and what really made this election so irritating is that Trudeau didn't lose um, the confidence of the House, which is what would have been what happened if if a vote had happened and he had gotten voted down. He went to the gov governor general, who is the Queen's representative, um, which is really just a, a rubber stamp, and asked for an election and got it. Um, so without actually losing um, confidence in the House, he called an election. A lot of people were scratching their heads saying, well, I'm not sure if this is the right time, the pandemic, Afghanistan was unraveling, and obviously we had people who were stranded there, there are wildfires in British Columbia, um, is this really the right time for an election? Uh, but he called it anyway, because in his eyes, um, the polling showed that it was possible for him to get a majority government, um, and that is not what he got. That is not the result that we are looking at this morning. He got another minority government, uh, 158 seats, the Conservatives coming second with 119 seats, which is exactly where we were before the election. Um, so we had this this 36-day election, um, and we more or less have the exact same outcome as we had before. So backing up to August when he kind of went and asked for this election, uh, what – just – Explain it to me like I'm five, because I really don't understand why he called this election. He had had some scandals, but he seemed to have mostly weathered those. He was getting dinged on COVID, but every world leader in the world is getting dinged on COVID. Nobody's really covering themselves in glory on that one. And Canada has relatively not been maybe as bad as some other places. So back in August, when this kind of all kicked off, was it just a straight political thing? Did he just think somehow he was going to gain a lot of seats here? Because it just, it doesn't, especially now that we have hindsight that it didn't really change anything. Why did he do that? Because he seems like he was in a decent position and he seems to just be in the same position except annoying people now. Yeah, so, I mean, the polling um, just prior to this election being called showed the liberals up relatively considerably in support. Um, so depending on your voter efficiency, um, so all of our ridings, which are congressional districts, are won first past the post. Um, so whoever gets the most votes wins, even if it's less than 50%, which is the majority of the ridings where there are multiple competitive candidates. Um, so they were looking at 38, 39% um, support in terms of vote intention. And that is if you have good vote efficiency enough to get a majority government. Um, and that was mostly because the pandemic response, um, despite their dings, has been perceived as being something quite positive. Um, the vaccine rollout early on was really slow, but then it, it kicked up into gear. Um, and they were kind of riding the high of the pandemic um, success, I guess is how they would call it. I'm not quite sure I would call it that, but that was the common perception. And so they thought they had it. Um, they thought they had it. And then, I mean, the election kicked off with the the fall of Kabul, um, which is not the greatest day to start your campaign when Canadians are stranded abroad and our interpreters are stranded there and everything that is about to unfold and unravel in Afghanistan. And yeah, I mean, it, it, just a miscalculation, really, um, on their part in terms of timing. Um, as to why they would want to do it, the reason why they would want a majority is because a majority means that they get four years of being able to pass whatever they want. Um, and they had a majority from 2015 to 2019. 
Um, and so to be able to get a majority again would have afforded them the ability to act on the promises that they've uh, they've made to Canadians. Um, because in a in a in a minority government that can be quite difficult. Uh, because if you want to put something forward and two of the other larger parties say no, well, if you do put it forward and they vote it down, you have an election. Um, and so that's where the horse trading kink comes in. And so from them, I think it was polling plus the idea of having more expedient government where they could really just have a free pass to push forward the legislation that they wanted. So like you were saying, world events kind of over swamped everything going on with this uh, campaign for the last 40 odd days. Uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of dynamicism or dynamics, if that's a better word, to this campaign in a lot of ways. And really one of the only highlights, and you did some commentary on this earlier, was the debate performances that the prime minister had were not overly impressive and just kind of seemed to muddle things up even further, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, he was he was visibly irritated. So the entire liberal campaign, um, once it became clear that they weren't going to be able to ride the pandemic high to a majority, um, they really kind of unleashed all of the old 2015 tactics that the liberals have always thrown at the conservatives, that they're not pro-choice, um, that they're not allies to the LGBTQ community, that they don't care about climate change, um, and really not not much of that stuck um, because Aaron O'Toole, for American listeners, would be like a Joe Manchin Democrat. Um, he wouldn't be a, a Republican by any means. Um, most conservatives probably would be in that, uh, I would say that Trudeau would, would maybe be like Obama-esque. The NDP under Jagmeet Singh are kind of like the squad, the AOCs, the Bernie Sanders. And then um, conservatives would fall maybe in between like a Mitt Romney and a, a Joe Manchin or a Chris, Kristen Sinema. Um, so really kind of hovering that, that centrist line. Um, and when those attacks didn't stick, you could see the frustration come over Trudeau and he would get snippy with reporters, which is not in his character. His debate performance is he looked on his heels and he was, he was really getting attacked from all sides. Um, and so you start to see, we started to see that frustration set in. And I think Canadians really saw beyond what they were trying to do. And that's in large part why we have the same result as we had before. Um, it was very much, do we want to give Trudeau a majority? The answer to that question was no. Um, and the other question was, do we want new government under the conservatives? And the answer to that question was no as well. You you touched on it, so let's just make sure we get the nomenclature right. When you're talking liberal and conservatives, these are not the way we use the terms in American politics. These are actually the parties more like kind of in the British oh, system, correct. which of course Canada yep. is a, you know, direct descendant of so the liberal party would be probably slightly more to the left than a center left party and the conservatives would be more like a moderate democrat more like what we would call the blue dog democrat sort of a party just kind of break down the nomenclature of those two main parties before we talk about these other ones because when yep. you talk about the conservatives and the liberals we're thinking ideologies but in canada those are the political parties mm -hmm. that's a very good point yeah so moving from the right to the left um the conservatives hover somewhere in between the Mitt Romney, um, what are now considered like centrist Republicans, and the Blue Dog Democrats. But they have a really strange coalition um, because that party is made up of social conservatives, which really don't have a, a, a political leg to stand on in Canada, um, fiscal conservatives, um, and then anyone in that kind of Romney to Manchin uh, spectrum. Um, our liberals are kind of center left Democrats. Um, so maybe a little more Obama esque or a little bit to the left of Obama. Um, they're in Canadian politics kind of seen as like the centrist party, um, just because there's parties on both sides of them. Uh, and then you have the NDP, the new democratic party which are like the Bernie Sanders, um, the, the AOC, the squad, the very progressive, they are more rep they more look like European socialists. Um, and then you have the Green Party, who 
are a left wing party focused on climate change, um, but they have th their support pretty much collapsed this election. They were dealing with a bunch of internal um, party squabbles over their leader uh, and what the party's position on Israel and Palestine should be, which is strange for, for a party focused on climate change. And then the new guys on the block uh, are the People's Party. And I would say that that party is much more similar to the Trump populists. Um, so they are relatively new. Maxime Bernier is the leader of the People's Party. They got like I think less than 2% of the vote in 2019. I think they're slated to get 5% of the vote this time around. So there is some emergence of that kind of populist viewpoint. Um, but the, the PPC, the People's Party, didn't get any seats um, in Parliament, including that of their leader. So that is the kind of broad strokes explanation of the, the, the five uh, major parties who run federally. And then there is one um, very difficult party to explain, which is the Bloc Québécois. So they only run candidates in Quebec. They are a Quebec nationalist slash sovereigntist party. Um, so that would be like if there was a strong movement um, in, let's say, New York or Texas, pick a large U.S. state or California, um, that wanted to separate on like cultural and linguistic grounds, uh, and they ran candidates on essentially that platform. Uh, and so the Bloc Québécois did pick up 34 seats in the province of Quebec. Um, so they are strange. Um, from an outsider's view, I mean, they're strange from an Anglophone view, which I am in Ontario, because I don't, there's no option for me to vote for the Bloc because they only have candidates in in Quebec, uh, but they do end up becoming, especially in a minority government, quite powerful, depending on what policies they lend their support to. And there's, of course, the long-running debate of whether they actually want what they say they want to get or if they just want to continue being that, but that's a whole other podcast for another day. Um, talk, yeah, ab yeah. talk about the conservatives for just a second. Aaron O'Toole is their leader. Uh, if, if mm -hmm. the, if the liberal party didn't gain anything, did the conservatives lose or did they just get a draw because they, they didn't unseat the prime minister? Obviously there is going to be a minority liberal government. Where, where does that leave them? You, you already mentioned the people's party, uh, gained a little bit, but it doesn't seem like they really took a chunk out of the conservatives. Where does that leave them as the main opposition party now? Well, so the Conservatives won the popular vote. Again, this is now the second election in a row that they've won the popular vote. Um, and the, the future of Aaron O'Toole and the Conservative Party really depends on who you talk to. For most Conservative Party members, this is a loss. Um, so Andrew Scheer, who ran in 2019 against Trudeau uh, in the midst of the blackface scandal and SNC-Lavalin, which was a corruption and... Um, some funny business going on there in terms of firing the attorney general. Um, they weren't, they got essentially the same result and Andrew Scheer was pushed out as leader essentially because members said, we should have done better. You should have done better. Um, so there's a strong contingent of folks who have said that Aaron O'Toole should have done better. Um, and the reason why that's relevant is because his election platform was very much moving to the middle. In the same way that we see uh, whoever wins, with the exception of Trump, uh, whoever wins the Republican primary usually moves to the right in the primary to win the primary and then moves back to the middle to be a little more tolerable to swing voters. Um, and so O'Toole did exactly that. He moved very much to the middle um, on a lot of key issues. And so there were some disgruntled conservatives who kind of held their nose and voted conservative but were unhappy that the party had moved so much to the middle and so there is going to be over the next two months or so um, a lot of internal discussion as to whether or not the conservatives need a new leader um, because to a lot of conservative partisans both 2019 and this election were winnable and the fact that they didn't win them shows that whatever the strategy was, was flawed. What do you make of Singh? Because he's sure getting a lot of press coverage. He's a young guy. He's dynamic. He's charismatic. Um, mm -hmm. Where does this leave him and his party, who is to the left of Trudeau on a lot of things, although it's not completely orthodox to what we would consider the left, but he, he did want massive increases in government spending, this sort of thing. 
Uh, mm-hmm. So just for the lack of a better way to explain it, he was running to Trudeau's left on some things. Uh, yep. Where does this leave him going for? Because he's only 42 years old, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. He's a young guy. He seems to be up and coming. Uh, talk about him and his NDP party a little bit. Yeah. Um, so very much big government, big spending, wealth tax, got to tax the corporations, all of your kind of Bernie Sanders playbook. Ironically, Bernie Sanders endorsed Jagmeet Singh. Um, on Twitter, um, which kind of solidifies that link between the progressive side of the Democrats and the NDP. Um, What is his future as party leader? This is a really tough one. Um, So the Liberal Party, if we go back um, 10 years or so, uh, or even longer, um, the Liberal Party collapsed. Um, They went from being the party in power to being the third party. And that I think that was probably the first time in our country's history that that had ever happened. And the NDP was led by a guy uh, named Jack Layton, very admirable. And they, I think the NDP had over 100 seats. Um, they were what we call the official opposition, so the, the party with the second most seats. Um, and now they only have 25. So they're nowhere near where they used to be, kind of at their peak. Um, and there are some questions, at least from my perspective, over whether or not Jagmeet Singh has it in him to shift the party or to reinvent themselves in a way that makes them more tolerable um, for Canadians. Um, I don't think that he does, but him on a personal level, he's very charismatic, he's admirable. Um, Even people who don't vote for the NDP say, well, if he was the leader of the Liberals or the leader of the Conservatives, they would vote for him in a heartbeat. Um, so his, I think he'll probably continue to stay on as leader of the NDP, but I would still say that they are in some trouble, um, mostly just because I don't see a path for them to get back to where they used to be under Jack Layton. And, uh, I mean, there's a variety of reasons for that. I, unless you want to chat for three or four hours, uh, I won't bore your listeners with the nuances of progressive politics in Canada, but, um, he'll likely stay on as leader because he is so admired, but that probably does not bode well for the party's future prospects in terms of an election. From what I can gather, though, the his charisma is the blessing and the curse in this case because the knock on him, at least from what I'm reading, you're there so you can explain it better than I can, is mm-hmm. he's, he's really big on, we hear it in American politics all the time, he's great on the platitudes but doesn't seem to have a lot of infrastructure ability underneath the platitudes to build a party and actually move legislation and the things you would need to do to build the party up. Is that is that a fair attack on him? And is that kind of yeah. dovetailing with where you're kind of going with it of like, I everybody seems to like him, but they don't know if he's actually going to be able to accomplish anything here. Yeah, yeah. And, and so the thing is, for, for liberal voters, um, both party and persuasion, the big knock on the NDP is, we like what you have to say, but how are you going to pay for it? And he always struggles to explain how they're going to, like an example would be, we want to completely nationalize senior care. So no private old folks homes, retirement uh, facilities and things like that. That's a pretty hefty promise. If you're going to come forward with something that radical, um, which I disagree with, but regardless on its merits, if you're going to come forward with something that radical, you better <laughs> you better have a very concrete plan in terms of how you're going to do it and what that's going to cost. Um, and so I think a lot of people see through the hype uh, in terms of who they actually choose to vote for. Um, so the question remains, in another election, whenever that is, um, is Jagmeet Singh going to be able to restructure his approach to where he is a little more serious on on policy and how it's going to get done? One party we haven't mentioned yet, the uh, who keeps popping up worldwide in different systems of government and never seems to really get a whole lot of traction, but the Green Party did not have themselves a good outing mm-hmm. in this election, did they? No. No, they got decimated. Their leader uh, ran in Toronto Centre, um, which should have been, I mean, not the easiest riding to win for them, but should have been better, and then she she just performed terribly there. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the party collapsed. Uh, essentially, it all came down to internal strife over what the party's position on um, Israel and Palestine should be. Uh, and just the real Coles Notes version is Anna Paul is a black woman who is Jewish. 
Um, she had a Jewish uh, chief of staff. Um, there are some uncomfortable factions of the Green Party who, um, not to throw this word around lightly, but who would largely fall in the um, anti-Semitic camp, or at least very close to it. Um, and so there was a lot of internal strife over whether or not the leader of the party gets to determine what their stance would be in regards to Palestine. And they, the, the party brass fired her chief of staff, and they attempted to restrict her funds in terms of what she could use in the campaign. And it just became very messy. And then as a result of that mess, they weren't able to run candidates in 80 ridings. Um, and now, were they going to win any of those 80 ridings? No. But it is important in terms of establishing that you still have some broad base of support, that you have candidates in those ridings um, to show that you can still get five, six, seven percent. They didn't do that, and that's really why they're they're less than three percent now, and they've been overtaken by the People's Party, which is only three years old, um, really. Um, and so it's it's a tough place for them, mostly also because when they did run a full slate of candidates they were like the de facto protest vote. So anyone who was like, ah, well, these options suck. I'm going to vote for the for the Greens. I know they're not going to win, but they suck a little less than, than the other guys. Uh, they don't have that position anymore um, with the emergence of the People's Party. And then insert the pandemic, which has been the People's Party's wedge issue, saying we don't want vaccine passports, we don't want mandates, we don't want um, mask mandates, any of that. Um, and so they've kind of lost their... They've lost their party infrastructure because they've made a mess of it. And then they've also lost their position as the protest vote. Um, and so I'm really not sure what the future is for them. They only have two seats um, on Vancouver Island, which is uh, out west um, in British Columbia. Uh, or sorry, um, they, they do have one in Ontario, which is a, an anomaly um, that occurred mostly because the, the liberal incumbent uh, had to step down due to a very serious sexual uh, misconduct allegation. Um, so yeah, I, the future of the Greens is is in jeopardy. I'm not sure. Um, they may end up being a footnote uh, in terms of Canadian politics within the next five uh, five to seven years. So the rough numbers that have come out, it looks like Liberals got about 32%, give or take. These will move a little bit, of course, as they finalize mm -hmm. everything. Conservatives got about 34%. The NDP got about 17 The Green got 2 and the PPC got 5 uh, we understand now that um, Justin Trudeau is going to stay on as prime minister, but he'll have to be a minority government that they'll have to form. Just explain mm -hmm. to folks, especially Americans and us that aren't familiar with that term, what that's going to look like in the coming weeks and then kind of where we go from here with this new, <laughs> the new alignment, same as the old alignment, pretty much. Well, I think it'll just, while the pandemic is going on, it'll just go back to how it was. Um, so if they're going to discontinue certain benefits or they're going to continue certain benefits or roll out new programs, they're really going to, for the liberals, they're going to have to get the NDP to agree with them. Um, or they're going to have to get the bloc or the conservatives to agree with them to get anything through. Otherwise they, they don't have enough, um, support in parliament to pass policy. So we're probably going to see more of the same, um, what will be interesting is two things, in my opinion. Um, I think that this minority government will last much longer um, than it usually does. So usually it's about a year and a half to two years. That's exactly what this one was. Um, the reason why I think it'll last longer is my prediction uh, is actually that Justin Trudeau will not run again uh, as leader of the Liberal hmm. Party in the next election. Um, I think that his political capital has probably been exhausted. And I think that economically and logistically, um, we are <laughs> we, we are about to come into a world of hurt in terms of dealing with the, the fiscal aftermath of what we've spent money on, um, the lack of real economic recovery, inflation creeping up. And so I could see Trudeau holding on for as long as possible, let's say a year and a half, two years, and then the Liberals doing their own new leadership race to determine who would the, who the, the next leader of the party would be, uh, and then going to an election probably six to 12 months after that. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. So that's my that's my rather bold prediction in terms of Justin Trudeau's political future. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. His dad certainly didn't live that way. Um, his dad had a majority government, lost, stayed on as liberal leader, came back, won another government um, after that. And so if he takes after his father, um, he may hold on a little longer than people would like. But I, I just don't see it at this moment. You talked about uh, there may be some pain on the horizon for the, the Canadian folks on the economic front. Two news items that are probably going to be driving that that have crossed the border into our news media and, quite frankly, have a lot of overlap to what's going on in America right now. Um, the housing issue and the housing crisis mm-hmm. and China. Those seem to be two things that overlap that we keep hearing in, in Canadian politics and Canadian culture discussion and also here in America. How are both of those playing right now, now that the election's over, outside of the pandemic? Those kind of seem to be the two big things, because we keep hearing about the housing situation in Canada. And you all got some issues going on with China, going back to some really ugly incidences last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where are those two issues right now, now that we got the election out of the way? Um, So housing crisis, I think we're pretty much screwed. Um, That's your deep, in-depth analysis that you're screwed. (laughs) Um, yeah, mostly because none of the parties act. So, I mean, the housing crisis is driven by a lack of supply and the federal government can't really do much. Um, they can promise to build a bunch of new houses, um, and, and like literally build them. And they have done that on occasion. Um, but it's, it's a very slow process and it's incredibly wasteful. I remember one of the liberal cabinet ministers prior to the election announced that they had built, they, they had built let's say 20, 20 affordable housing un- units in Fredericton, New Brunswick at an average cost of 550 grand, which is like more than the median price of a house in Fredericton. And so you literally could have given people 400,000, saved taxpayers a bunch of money and had those people buy houses <laughs> privately. Um, and so, yeah, there, there really is no solution. The only leader who put forward anything that the federal government could do was the conservative leader, Aaron O'Toole, who said that they would tie federal funding for certain infrastructure projects to density. So if, com- if communities are going to block development, um, which they do, NIMBYism is alive and well in, um, in most Canadian cities as it is in the U.S., um, they were going to basically block funding unless they met, cer- met certain density targets. Um, the Trudeau Liberals aren't going to do that. Um, so there's really not much that's going to be done federally to increase supply. They're going to fiddle with ways to influence demand, like ban uh, foreign buyers. Um, but that's really not going to do much in terms of tempering the demand that exists. So I, I think the stat that I heard the other day was if you took all of the millennials who are still living with their parents and you were to give them the cash to buy a house, there aren't actually enough homes being built to, to, to wow. have those people move into houses. So it's just, that's incredible. There, yeah, there's just not enough supply. Um, and so, yeah, on that one, we're, we're in big trouble. Um, and then on China, that's an issue that really matters to me, but it's, it's not one foreign. Canada is weirdly unique in this way that foreign policy is, in my opinion, Trudeau's probably one of his biggest weaknesses. But Canadians traditionally do not vote on issues of foreign policy um, unless it's very drastic, like whether or not we should participate in the war in Iraq. Now, we didn't have an election at that time, but Canadians were overwhelmingly opposed to joining the U.S. effort in Iraq. And that's what Prime Minister Jean Chrétien did um, at the time, is he did not commit us to that. Um, So we don't really vote on foreign policy. So there may be issues and gaffes and problems. but I don't think that that will move the needle uh, in terms of um, how people feel about the Liberal Party and this new minority government. What I do think is really going to hurt them is stagnating economy, debt increasing, inflation going up. If inflation continues to rise, you got to, you, in my opinion, you have two scenarios. Either you let it go, and I mean, that hurts lower income, middle income people the most. Or you change the the Bank of Canada's mandate, um, and and you <laughs> you you essentially raise rates. Um, but if you raise rates 
there's a lot of people who are going to get dinged from that and the economic turmoil that, that results from that. Um, and then obviously I think taxes are going to have to go up. The carbon tax is slated to increase. And so the combination of all of these things um, for ordinary people could create a tipping point, in my opinion, over the next two years where people are looking at this and going, whoa, this life is getting in, in, increasingly more difficult. Um, and these guys have been in power, whether majority or minority, since 2015. Um, and so that could be an opportunity for the conservatives to give a different option. If, like right now, we haven't really felt the full brunt of what the economic situation looks like post-COVID because we're not there yet. But when we do, I think it's going to be pretty ugly. Um, and so I also think that that was maybe in part why Trudeau would have wanted a majority at this moment because then he doesn't have to face the music in terms of the electoral consequences for another four years. Um, but now he'll very much have to face that music every day um, and every vote in the House of Commons. You uh, you put your marker down that you think we'll be doing this election again in a year and a half to two years, but uh, I think I sensed some frustration in your tweet last night when you said, and I'm quoting you, so glad we spent $600 million to basically be back where we were 40 days ago. Uh, is is that just kind of the capstone on this election that we just spent 40 days of sound and fury of Canadian politics to wind up right where we started? Or do you see another lining in this? No, no. I mean, there's no there's no silver lining here. Um, we got I mean, liberal partisans for the first few weeks of the election were saying, no, this is absolutely the right time. Canadians deserve to vote on who they want to lead us out of the pandemic. And Canadians voted and they said, well, we'll take exactly what we had before, please. Um, and so there is in it like every major editorial board, um, even the Toronto Star, which is traditionally left wing, loosely endorsed the liberals so much so that they said, we want the liberals to win, but they, we want them to win a minority. And that will show that the election was a big waste of time. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, pretty strong words. Um, from from groups who are on the left is they weren't even really that excited about about this election um, and the Liberal Party in particular. He's David Coleman. He's a good friend of ours. We appreciate him greatly. You've got a lot of stuff going on between Consumer Choice Center, Consumer Choice Radio. Let the folks know where they can find you because I know I'm leaned on you for this Canadian stuff, but you're good on a lot of other things that I enjoy. So let the folks know where they can find you and your work, my friend. Yeah, um, at Clement Liberty on uh, on Twitter, uh, consumerchoicecenter.org is the organization. Consumerchoiceradio.com is our radio show where we have uh, hosted you before, and I'm sure we will have you back on the program. Um, I traditionally spend a lot of my time writing um, about consumer issues nationally, uh, both in Canada and the U.S. Uh, for a couple of the larger regional papers in the U.S. Uh, for those interested, so. If you're you're if you if you want more of my hot takes, <laughs> that's that's where you can find me. It, and once we translate it from Canadian, it comes out somewhat moderately lukewarm, so it's not that hot. But you do great work, sir, and I appreciate you greatly. <laughs> Thank you for smartening us up to Canadian politics and working through this election for us. And yeah, I I can't wait to talk to uh, you and our buddy Al L again as soon as we can. Uh, you do good work, and I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much for the time today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I appreciate you, sir. You know, it's interesting. We call this culture and politics because there's so much overlap. And something like the housing crisis that Canada is dealing with seeped onto a lot of Americans' radars through the cultural angle, not the political or economic one. The very popular HGTV TV network, a lot of their popular stars and shows like Property Brothers, like Love It or List It, were originally shows that were filmed in Canada, and a lot of American audience would see homes and home prices and just be like, what is going on there? It's to the point that Love It or List It actually started filming in Raleigh, North Carolina to kind of get the home prices back in line with what most American viewers were expecting. But it's funny how that kind of seeps in and people just like, well, what is going on in Canada? Well, I appreciate us getting somebody like David Clement to come on. He's been a friend for a while. And this is what we try to do on Herd Tell. We turn down the noise on something and we just go to the information and try to get it as best we can. Our neighbors to the north have a very different system than us. It's the parliamentary system. It comes from England. 
And it's something that's worth studying and worth watching, not just because they're neighbors and friends and good allies of ours, but because we do have interconnected economies. If the economy goes bad in Canada, like David and a lot of other people think might be on the horizon, that's not good for America either. We don't have fences up economically that's going to prevent overwash. And let's be honest, America's economy ain't all that great either. It's important for us to pay attention to it. Because what happens over there is not going to stay over there. We're all in this together to a certain extent, and we need to know what's happening. And that goes beyond just whether or not Justin Trudeau is prime minister or on a Rolling Stone cover or on scandals that cross over and get into American media. Our neighbors to the north aren't going anywhere, and they've been good friends to us. And we want them to be as happy and healthy as possible, not just so we can maintain our friendship, but so that America can have a good, secure northern border and a good neighbor and the good friend that the Canadians have been for a long, long time. That's it for her tell. Appreciate you joining us wherever you're listening to this podcast, whatever platform, whether it's iTunes, Spotify, Google, Stitcher. We're on pretty much every platform you can think of. Please leave a comment and a rating if they give you an option to do that. That's really important for other folks and those platforms to know that what we're doing here is worth checking out. And we're going to continue to work really hard to give you something that is worth your time. Turning down the noise on the news cycle, getting to good quality information so that you can discern the times we live in. And as long as you keep listening, we'll keep doing it. So until we hear from you next time, we hope you and yours are well. However this finds you, until we talk to you on the next Herd Tell, y'all take care. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Somos la máquina.